Hello. Hi, this is Kel at Roy's. I just missed your call. Hey, sorry. It's Brian giving a call. Oh, hi. How are you, Brian? <laughs> Doing good. Did I catch you at an okay time? There's so much craziness going on. It, and it I... there's, a, there's a little craziness, but I'm always happy to talk. Yes, and I'm just in call time. <laughs> so. Um, well, Kelda, I, I heard something that really troubled me today about, um, you know, he... Uh, he went ahead and signed a, a bill. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the bill that Walker just signed about, um, in fact, there's two of them that, that seem to be really offensive. Yes. Well, um, our understanding is that in secret, um, without notifying, certainly without notifying Democratic legislator, legislators and apparently without notifying the press, Walker signed into law four war on women bills um, dealing with a whole range of topics from medically accurate sex education, repealing that, to uh, interfering in the doctor-patient relationship for women who need abortion care, to repealing Wisconsin's pay equity laws. I don't know where to begin first, but I mean, can, can you go into some, some more detail and share your insight on the, uh, the medically accurate sex education bill? Sure. Uh, in the last session, I and my colleague, Representative Grigsby, authored the Healthy Youth Act in response to really a, a health crisis among young people in Wisconsin. Um, the incidence of teen pregnancy and sexually transmitted disease was uh, unbearably high in our state. And we know from decades of research that the very best way to reduce teen pregnancy and sexually transmitted disease is to provide age-appropriate comprehensive sex education. So we passed the Healthy Youth Act, which was absolutely the gold standard in sex education. It talks to young people about contraception use, about abstinence, uh, about healthy decision making. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the Republicans came in and because they are opposed to contraception, um, they made it their mission to repeal the Healthy Youth Act, not only to repeal it, but to take out the requirement that information be given to young people that's medically accurate. And in fact, they mandated that information that is medically false be given to young people. Specifically, the repeal bill says that young people must be told now that absence is the only reliable way to prevent pregnancy. And that is not true at all. <laughs> if it were true, there would be a lot of people walking around with 15 children. <laughs> um, abstinence is certainly a reliable way. It is the most reliable way, but it is not the only reliable way to prevent pregnancy and sexually transmitted disease. Uh, so that's incredibly problematic. Um, teen childbearing currently costs Wisconsin taxpayers $168 million per year. Wow. And um, so this bill is going to have a devastating impact certainly on the bottom line for the taxpayers, but also on the lives and health of many young people around the state. Okay, um, hold on one sec, I need to double check here. Um, so I... Sorry to start off with such a depressing topic, Brian. No, and I actually had a tech issue here. I normally like to have a backup and I noticed my backup wasn't recording my voice. So uh, it got you, but not the question. Um, so I'm good that I oh. have um, <laughs> the original. <laughs> so, but I, I watched some of that debate and some of the things about the debate that are buried in the bill in addition is something about um, presenting and uh, not being required to present scientifically verified information or something like that. Right. They basically, what they did was they changed uh, some of the definitions in the statute so that Wisconsin is no longer required to provide medically accurate information to young people. Um, you know, medically accurate, it had a very specific definition in the statute, and, uh, and they changed it and, and took that, 
that definition out. And I, and I actually don't have the language in, in front of me right now, but um, but I can certainly look that up for you and tell you exactly what the definition was that they replaced it with. But in any case, you know, the bill itself also mandated that this medically inaccurate information be given to young people. And I mean, I know that um, during the debate, it was you you alluded to it that it's it's the gold standard. But I mean, that's not just your opinion; that's actually tested facts and results proven in, you know, in comparison with other states' effectiveness that the Healthy Youth Act was actually proven to be, uh, if not the most effective, one of the most effective uh, and most successful programs in the country. Right. The Healthy Youth Act, basically what we did was we looked at data all around the country and even internationally, and there's been extensive data and research over decades to look at what are the components of a successful sex education curriculum. Now, we didn't pick any specific curriculum. Um, local school boards will still be determining, you know, what curricula they use, what components. But we said these are this is the baseline. So just like with any other subject where we say, you know, if you're going to teach history, then you have to teach, you know, U.S. history, the Civil War, you know, the Revolutionary War. You have kind of minimum standards. That's what we did with the Healthy Youth Act. Mm -hmm. So it teaches decision-making, you know, risky behaviors, how alcohol and, and drug use can impair your judgment, um, how to prevent dating violence and sexual assault body image, I mean, all these things that are really important components of a comprehensive human growth and development program. And, you know, the United States has among the highest teen pregnancy rates and the highest abortion rates and the highest sexually transmitted disease rates in the developed world. And the reason why is because we are really the only country in the developed world that, that, uh, will close our ears to the evidence that young people need comprehensive sex ed and they need access to contraception in order to prevent pregnancy and, and disease. Um, and even though there's a number of other subjects I want to talk to you about, the depth of, of what was included in this bill that is surprising and isn't well known is really shocking and troubling to me. So the other part about this that... Um, that I noticed during the, the debates was, um, and, and it's, you have to combine it with knowledge of what's, what's going on. I know that the, the ideologues and Tea Party have been actually um, sending statewide trainings and encouraging as many people to get active in uh, the government process as possible, and they've been actually trying to take over school boards, which are, have been typically... Um, run almost unopposed. Uh, it's it's it kind of falls. There there are very few votes, very few candidates, and many times anybody who wants to be a part of a school board, they're they're looking for help. Well, part of the huh. bill that came came up is is after they've started to seat all of these school school boards with ideologues, then they make part of this bill um, have a condition that the school no longer has to actually tell the parents that. Hey, we decided to stop teaching sex ed. We we decided to tell your kids, you know, um, only a very limited view of of the best way that they can take care of themselves and prevent pregnancy and prevent disease. They don't have to actually inform the parents that they've made this decision. It can be made at the school board mm -hmm. level, and parents who think their kids are getting an education um, are actually getting uh, an indoctrination. So that that's well, troubling yeah. to me. It's incredibly troubling. I mean, one of the things that we were concerned about when we passed the Healthy Youth Act was the fact that most Wisconsin parents believe that their kids were getting comprehensive sex ed, and they overwhelmingly want that because it's hard. It's hard as a parent to talk about these issues with your your child, um, you know, and it can be embarrassing. And parents want to they want to make sure that their kids have the information, but it isn't easy to do. And, and so uh, the fact that 
parents believed that their kids were getting sex education and they actually weren't. It was a huge, huge problem. So one of the things we made sure to do in the Healthy Youth Act was say, if you're not going to teach sex education, that's fine. We don't mandate it. But you have to notify parents. You have to tell parents so that they have the opportunity to say, oh, my gosh, you know, the schools aren't going to do this, even though I assumed they were. I better make sure that I'm finding alternative ways for my my child to learn about this really important life-saving information. Yeah, if, um, if they're not going to have the talk at school, then I have right. to have the talk because someone's got to exactly. have the talk. <laughs> or, or ask the doctor to have the talk or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, and so so that's hugely problematic because now um, parents are not even going to be told. Now, what, what we also did in the Healthy Youth Act was say anybody can see the materials and they can opt their child out of any or all of the, the curricula. Um, so if, if your child, if you want them to go to a certain number of modules, but not a module having to do with, you know, use of condoms, that's fine. Um, because we wanted to empower parents and we really wanted to foster dialogue between um, parents and their young people. It that's sounds like it was structured to respect a parent's right to know what their children were being taught and a parent's right to choose um, for religious or moral reasons what they didn't want their kids exposed to at school. That was in the Healthy Youth Act and then now that part's been repealed. That's exactly right. And, um, you know, and it is really troubling to me as somebody with two stepdaughters that now state law is not going to require schools to tell me to even notify me if the school's not going to be teaching sex education. Hmm. I, I find that really problematic. Um, I'm a dad. This, this, this is serious. Yeah. So, but there's a lot more that I want to talk to you, and you're super busy. <laughs> um, <laughs> do I have time for another couple of questions? Sure. Great. Um, tell me about how this, you know, I want to talk to Dave Hansen about this too, because I know he was a part of the initial bill, but the, the Equal Pay for Women Act, or what, what's that called and what just happened? Well, the Pay Equity Act was passed in 2009 um, because it was very, very difficult when, when a woman was discriminated against, i.e. paid less than a man for doing the same work, the same job. Uh, she had to go through a very, very long and arduous and expensive administrative process before she even got to set foot in court and make her case. So um, we wanted to make sure that uh, people who are discriminated against, not just women, but if you're a person of color, um, if you're disabled, you know, for whatever reason, if you've experienced discrimination in the workplace, you should have the right to go into court and make your case, um, you know, to prevent people basically from, from walking into court until after they've gone through some burdensome administrative process, in my view, as an attorney, uh, is unfair. I mean, this is why we have courts. And, uh, you know, given the backlog we have in the federal system, given the strain that um, our state employees and state agencies are placed under, it seems only right that if a person has a strong claim of discrimination, that they should be able to go straight to court. And so we finally passed that bill. And the Republicans repealed it because they don't, they want to make it more difficult to go after employers who are bad actors. And there aren't very many, but it still is a problem. And in fact, there wasn't even a single lawsuit filed uh, under the Equal Pay Act during the years when it had, it's been enforced. So the idea that somehow, you know, it's problematic for businesses, I think is ridiculous. You know, I don't believe that there are many Wisconsin businesses who are only profitable because they're discriminating against women or because they're discriminating against, you know, Latinos. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah. I remember in the lead up to the, the bill, the discussion of there was a specific case of a woman who had been discriminated against, but she didn't find out about it. She took the same job as a colleague and worked in that job for something like, I don't know, I might get the exact numbers wrong, but something like 15 years and she earned 40% less, but she found out close to her retirement that she was earning less than, you know, mm -hmm. her peer. 
and the the defense was, well, you didn't complain about this soon enough. You didn't complain about it within the 90 days of the pay differential. So because of that, you have no claim in court. And exactly that sounds kind of bogus to me that um, just because you don't know you're getting discriminated against because it takes you a while to find out that everybody <laughs> else is getting paid more than you doesn't doesn't mean right. the crime never existed. Yes, uh, and bogus is exactly the word. Actually, that woman was Lily Ledbetter, and she was an employee at Goodyear Tires. And um, I actually had the opportunity to meet her earlier this week. She really is a remarkably strong woman, and she suffered, you know, grievously for uh, fighting back against this outrageous discrimination that she suffered. And um, even so, she has not seen one dime from from her many victories in court because her her case, her ultimate case, was overturned by the Supreme Court. They said, basically, you should have known that you were being discriminated against. And, uh, and, if, and if you didn't know and remedy it from the first paycheck that you received that was less than a man, then you lose your right. And that's why President Obama, the first law that he signed into, uh, that he signed as president was the Lilly Ledbetter Pay Equity Act that says, basically, overturns that Supreme Court case that denied her recompense for her, uh, her suffering. Okay. Well, thanks for filling in the details because I, I had known and was really, you know, surprised by how that worked out. And um, I mean, it it's nice that she she's got an inspiring story, but it kind of sucks that she had to go through that to bring bring the story to light. So exactly, exactly. You know, and there there you know, discrimination is incredibly difficult to prove in court. Um, it really is only the very egregious cases that you could even find a lawyer to take your case um, because they're just they're too expensive they're too hard to put together and they take years and years and years so um, you know and that's that's why uh, some companies can unfortunately get away with it and the Republican leadership we have seems to want to make it easier and easier for companies to get away with this kind of outrageous discrimination but of course doesn't just impact those women workers, it impacts their families, too, and the whole economic security of our community. Yeah, and, you know, the ability of, of that family to keep their, their children in, in safe and protected environments and, and all of that. And what I've also been seeing is people are getting really brazen about actually boasting about how they're discriminating. The, the new Verify the Recall uh, petition list is being used you know, nearly every day I get another story or another screenshot and people boasting of how many people uh, they've fired because they found their signature on a recall list. And um, well, that, Yeah, that is an outrage. Um, and I actually foresaw that this might be a problem. Um, and I introduced a bill. I, I wrote a, a bill that would have prohibited employment discrimination based on whether or not someone signed or didn't sign a recall petition or nomination signatures. Um, you know, that's a right that we have as citizens. And just like our right to vote, it shouldn't be taken away because our employer doesn't agree with our political views. Yet, of course, you know, the Republicans didn't even take out my bill, wouldn't even give it a hearing. And it's, this isn't something that the, that the mainstream press is covering. They're actually doing their best to, to bury this. Um, so it's the stories of it are, are traveling on social media, and what we're also seeing is that some of the other mainstream media, like one of the biggest recipients of all of the campaign cash flow advertising money, after it's generated uh, all over the country, Walker's going out and picking up his million dollar checks, it gets mm -hmm. spent in the Milwaukee <laughs> advertising market that's where most of it winds up so WTMJ actually now digging through the the recall signature database themselves and then bragging about how they're harassing and intimidating and discriminating against their own employees wow. for signing the database but then not actually you know the act of choosing to sign a petition or refusing to sign a petition, both of those 
carry equal bias. You either refuse to sign because you have a bias against it, or you choose to sign because you have a bias for it. And they're only right. uniquely punishing the oh. ones that sign the petition, and they're not calling out everybody else to say, see, you look at all this bias. You need to be disciplined because you didn't sign it. <laughs> I mean, it's like... Exactly. That's really <laughs> brazen. I don't understand how that's not inflaming the media until I look at how much money the media is making off of all of this campaign cash flow mm -hmm. and commercials and advertising that's getting dumped into them. And then it's like, oh, okay, don't bite the hand that feeds you million-dollar ad buys. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. Simple. Yeah. All right, the other thing that – well, go on. Oh, go ahead. I don't want I, I don't want to switch too fast if you have one, one more insight on that but there's um there's the other uh, important subject of what's been going on up north that we'll segue into after Yeah no no please go ahead. Well the the I wanted to find out more about um uh, what you know about the the domestic terrorism and firebombing of a planned parenthood up north and um is it being dealt with and called and labeled and prosecuted as as the terrorism that it is, or is it? Does it seem like it's being brushed under the rug, or you know, and as well some of the cultural things that are happening to enable that kind of behavior to happen? So, what's your insight on on that? Well, from what I understand, and of course I'm, you know, I I talk with many of the people who work at Planned Parenthood and advocates, and, and I've seen the statements from law enforcement, and I, I am really gratified that it seems they are taking this very seriously, and this this attack, I mean, the FBI just vowed that it would absolutely um, be standing up to the, this kind of domestic terrorism um, and would defend women's access to health clinics, and frankly, women and men go to Planned Parenthood for a variety of health care services. And, um, you know, and, and they're required to do so under federal law. Um, so, so I think that's, that is comforting to know. But what's, what's very troubling is how common these kind of acts of violence and terrorism are. Um, in 2011, uh, there were actually over 100 separate acts of violence against family planning clinics, against providers of health care. Um, and endangering, obviously, the public and the patients as well. So, uh, you know, Planned Parenthood is one very, very critical provider of health care for many millions of people in this country, and particularly low-income women and men who don't have anywhere else to turn. And the fact that they do that work and they provide that care safely to their patients um, is a tremendous credit to them um, under really – unacceptable, egregious threats uh, of violence and terrorism. And, and we need to not be silent about this. Mm -hmm. We must call them out for, uh, for what, for not only the fact that these attacks are, are a form of domestic terrorism, but also that some of the rhetoric by many mainstream Republican and conservative political leaders help to enable an environment where people feel they can get away with these kind of attacks and that they're acceptable somehow. I mean, Scott Walker has been totally silent on these attacks. And and this very week, when we saw a healthcare facility in our state bombed, he signed into law four anti-woman, anti-health bills into law. Yeah, I would I would almost venture a guess that that doesn't even qualify as silence. That that qualifies as, you know, instead of coming out to condemn it, he just keeps the train moving, rolling right forward, and and reemphasizes it with litigation that kind of puts an exclamation point on the whole issue. Um, not condemning it seems um, inexcusable to me. But um, what about some of the other, have you heard of any statements condemning it from any of the other um, politicians up in the area? I know Michelle Litchens takes uh, women's health uh, seriously as one of her initial campaign issues to come in. Has she come out and condemned anything? I have not seen reported 
um, any instance of a Republican, either the state or federal level, coming out against these kind of attacks other than um, Lisa Murkowski, um, and that was not specific to the Planned Parenthood incident, but Lisa Murkowski put out um, a statement or was quoted as basically saying, I don't know what the GOP is doing. They are really um, waging a war on women. And she was criticizing her fellow Republicans, I believe, on the issue of their failure to denounce Rush Limbaugh for referring to a law student as a slut because she was advocating for non-discrimination in contraceptive coverage. Um, yeah, and I think I heard a response to that um, from Rince Priebus. <laughs> Uh, right. No, a, a response to anything calling it a war on women. Uh, and Rince Priebus mentioned that that was a complete press fabrication and, and likened it to um, a war on caterpillars. So, oh, well. It's like, um, that just shows you how totally out of touch he is. I mean, that he would compare um, the very real concerns of millions of women across this country to an insect, um, I mean, that really just tells you everything we need to know about his his thinking and his, his view of, you know, women's roles and our, our very legitimate policy and political concerns. I'll, I have to confess, um, it, it may surprise you, but I actually celebrated uh, along with the Republicans when Rince uh, was uh, announced as the leader of the Republican Party, but probably for the exact opposite reasons that most of the Republicans did, because I think he, he occupies that same sort of space, kind of like Scott Fitzgerald, um, that almost every time he opens his mouth, he, re he reveals himself as like a clueless douchebag elite. It's really hard for me to think of any other terms that describe him, but I almost welcome every time he talks because it's hard for him to talk without putting his foot in his mouth. And... <laughs> The more, the more he does, the more I cheer. It's like, you know, you're laying the case for us, buddy. It, it, if you can be that clueless and that offensive, uh, it's, it's either uh, incompetence or by choice, and neither is an acceptable <laughs> reason. So um, I think I'll probably edit that part out of our interview, but <laughs> that's really, dude is just... He's got some problems. He's probably got some army issues too. So, uh, is there anything else uh, coming up? I know that you're involved in in a. Um, uh, we're going to be seeing you tomorrow um, for a uh, an event at the Capitol. You want to tell me about that? Yes, um, tomorrow I and uh, Representative Tamara Grigsby and a number of other advocates are going to be appearing and speaking in solidarity at, at the hoodie rally um, in memory of Trayvon Martin and Bo Morrison and, uh, and the tremendous tragedy that their deaths are for, for our nation and what it says about how far we have to go as a country um, until we have a world that is safe and secure and fair for everyone. So I'll, I will be there at noon. And, um, and there will be a rally and a march around the Capitol. And um, we'll be wearing our hoodies in, uh, in solidarity with, um, with, obviously, their family and friends who, you know, who are going to be suffering from their loss for, for the next, you know, for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I appreciate your, your time. Um, I'm pretty sure I'll see you tomorrow for that, but I wanted to catch you beforehand and see if we can't get some uh, media and, and interviews up, because uh, all of these stories are really, even though the uh, the legislator's over for the session, it, things don't really stop around here, and you got to keep your ear open, so thanks for uh, exactly sharing right. your insight. Well, I hope, uh, I hope you bring your son, he's really cute. <laughs> <laughs> yep, he should, uh, he should be there, in, in fact, I think... Um, I think we even have a hoodie. <laughs> All right. Sounds great. <laughs> All right. Well, take care. And thanks for calling thanks, back. Brian. Bye. No problem. Bye.